start with the first thing of who the fuck am I? Um, my name is Kara Brown. I am an author. I write under urban <laughs> fantasy and I write under romance. Uh, the romance I have under another pen name, which is Faye Black. So if you want to go look that up, you are more than welcome to. Uh, I am a developmental editor and a copy editor over at Ripperverse LLC. That is not a book publisher, that is a comic publisher, but I do go through all yes. the scripts and I do make those amendments. So prior to me working there, I did also work for two indie publishers in the past. One was for fantasy and the other one was for romance. So that is my background and my credentials in being able to speak about this topic with you guys today. So the main objectives for today, by the end of this presentation, my hope is that you will uh, know when and when not to add romance to your novel, uh, to be able to understand the different types of romance that can happen within your novel, uh, be able to find ways to weave that romance into your novel, and be able to understand main romance beats. Now, um, I'm going to go ahead and let you guys know that when we get to main romance beats, there's a lot that I'm going to say there, but don't worry, I wrote it all down for you. At Wait. the end of this presentation, I'm going to give you a copy of my slides for your reference, and in the notes of the slides, it's going to have all those details in there for you. So, if you're thinking that this is a class lecture and you got to take notes, no, you don't got to do that. It's fine. Uh, in reference, if you guys are interested, these are three books that I would recommend to your arsenal if this is something that you would like to expand on. There is Seven Figure Fiction by T. Taylor, where she talks about how to add butter into the story, so to speak. It's a really good short book. And uh, the idea of the universal fantasy is being able to pull the escapism that your reader is looking for and how to integrate it into your romance. Now, she does uh, obviously focus on romance, but the principles in which she kind of uses within this writing, you can really apply it to anywhere. So uh, really good book. I highly recommend it. Uh, creating character arcs. This talks about the different types of character arcs that happen within a story. And I'm mentioning it for romance because uh, romance still follows these main beats. So if you're looking for something that's more overarching but not quite as focused as this topic may be, also really good romance or good uh, reference to have in your arsenal. And then the main one that I'm really going to be basing today's lecture off of is Romancing the Beat by Gwen Hayes. So Gwen Hayes really breaks down the formula in regards to adding romance to a story. And she's quite artful in this. Uh, she actually starts off with like, hi, my name is Gwen. And I like writing kissing books, and I also edit kissing books, and kissing books are my favorite thing ever. So, great branding there, if that's something that you guys would like to have there. But if you're also, it's about as short as the seven-figure fiction book, so quick reads, easy, very concise, always good to have in your arsenal. Okay, so, I know not everybody here is a romance author, right? I don't think uh, anyone here is. <laughs> you shut your whore mouth. Um... I oh, except every... you. <laughs> except you. Um, so, but not every not everybody here is a romance author. Not everybody wants to add romance there, but I'm going to make a quick case about why you should think about it at the very least. So, why should you add romance to your existing novel? Um, one part is that it does add another subplot to a story. Uh, that's all. That's the big go-to that everybody adds uh, when they're talking about why you should put romance in there. My big takeaway, though, is that it actually will help with uh, developing character arcs and backstory. And I'll explain why on that just a little bit more. But uh, the other element is that it will humanize characters. It will give them a little bit of extra death. It will give them that vulnerability that uh, allows people to be more invested in them. Uh, it would also, as you can see there on the fourth bullet point, increase that emotional investment. It's that thing that sometimes will make your character kind of quietly root for that character. Or look at the page and, you know, basically scream, you dumb fuck, don't say that, right? And then the other thing um, is it's something that you can take away. Now, when I say that, um, you guys missed this wonderful, articulate ranting that Venom was doing before we started. Um, but he was doing this, this good talk about how this character went and did all these things to achieve everything and then had it taken away from him, right? Same thing can happen with romance. Um, some really good examples that I like to pull forward for that is going to be uh, actually a lot of Chinese films. <laughs> a lot of Chinese films will have people find love and then the love interest dies where they both die at the end, right? It's, it's the tragic beat that they like to do. But if you're looking for ways to inflict suffering or cause tension within the character, having something happen to the love interest obviously is the quick way to do that. Now, I would be a very terrible presentator I would tell you why not to add romance to your story. Um, I am a big advocate for romance. I really love it, but I know it has a time and place, and sometimes it's not within what you're working on right now. 
If you are trying to do romance for the sake of filling pages because you don't know what else to do, don't add it. If you are adding romantic interest who are shallow and static characters, don't do it. And for those of you who are like, what's a static character? Uh, a static character is a character that is not fleshed out in any capacity, which means that as soon as your main character leaves the page with that, that love interest, they're not doing anything. They've got no motivation. They've got no interest. They've got nothing, right? So if they only appear on the page for the sake of the love interest, don't do it. Uh, another reason to not add it is if it's somehow it takes over your plot. Uh, a lot of individuals create really in-depth plots, but then if you start writing the romance and the romance becomes the overarching thing and not the actual thing that you wanted to write, go ahead and throw it out. It's fine. You have my permission. Uh, another reason to not do romances is if you are only relying on cliches and stereotypes, but this is not to be confused with tropes. Tropes are subtle expectations that your readers have for how things will go, where stereotypes are basically those things that kind of teeter on the line of, of racism, and we don't want to do that. So. Uh, the other reason, if it doesn't fit your story, if you are writing some kind of gore porn thriller story and somebody told you to throw romance into it, you have my permission again, don't add it. Don't throw it in there. It's fine. Uh, and then the very last reason, which is probably the most important reason, you don't want to add it. And you don't have to. If you are told by somebody that maybe these two characters should have a lunch, love interest and in your gut, all you hear is, no, I don't like that, and your very soul is rebelling against it again, not that you need my permission, but sometimes it's nice to hear. You don't have to add it. It's fine. Okay, so I could be here for a very long time talking about the different types of romance tropes and how they come about, but what I will do is I'm going to talk about the more common ones that will happen in various romances, not just within the romance wow, genre itself. You, you hate it, but it's popular. <laughs> um, so the types of romance that you will see in any kind of genre, regardless of where it is, you're going to have the established couple. So think uh, Martha and Jonathan Kent, right? You know, from Marvel, as much as some of us hiss at that, that particular publisher right now. see. Yeah. Um, but they are an established couple. They've been together for a long time. Uh, you've got the slow burn couple. Those are the individuals that have been together um, as maybe friends or childhood friends. You kind of see this in anime a lot where they knew each other as kids and they were best buddies in high school and then went to college and suddenly fell in love kind of thing. Uh, the Rekindle Old Love is, uh, think about, I know not a lot of people here have read The Notebook, but The Notebook would be the example of that, of somebody that you had a fling with when you were younger, you went your separate ways, and then when you became older, you reconnected and then got that love again kind of conversation. That's what the uh, rekindling of an old flame is. Uh, a failed romance, this usually happens in what we refer to as a negative arc uh, story, which is where the character starts in a good place, and then throughout the course of the story, the arc goes down and the character starts off worse than they were. I would almost say that for Batman, who's my, my common go-to for this, Batman has a failed romance arc all the time. Um, because in a lot of cases, like, he'll get with somebody, he can almost have happiness, and then for some reason, the relationship breaks up. Maybe he decides that being Batman is too important, so his life doesn't have the space for love, or maybe settling to Kyle on the day that they're supposed to get married, breaks up and says, no, you have to always be Batman. I hate that story plot so much. It makes me very angry. But Hey, they on. knew what they signed up for. I God. hate it. God. I hate it. Ah. I hate it so much. Um, and then, obviously, as... As Venom was just talking about, the, the multiple love interests, which is most common in YA. I can go ahead and tell you why that that's really common. And the reason it's really common kind of goes back to the universal fantasy concept of being wanted by other people. Uh, for some individuals, it might be having two guys pining over them and it makes them feel kind of, uh, I hate saying the word empowered, but it, it, it kind of lifts them up from where they were before because instead of having nothing, now they have to like war between the affections of two people that are polar opposite of each other. And through the course of the story, they have to figure out which one's right for them. And I'm not going to touch on any more of that because that kind of romance in YA is not my, my drive. So I'm going to move on. And then you have the romance avoider, which for some of you, you'll be like, what is the romance avoider? The romance avoider is somebody who just doesn't want romance, period, in their life uh, for whatever reason. And the reason that this is a type of romance is just because it's a, it's a negative aspect of romance. But the thing that's really important about this is that it's an active choice, right? 
it's a choice that somebody has made that they don't want to engage in romance. And the question I want to ask you, if this is your protagonist, is to take a moment and ask yourself why this is. Is it the choice because they had a bad love experience when they were a teenager? Did they get burned by a bad ex-wife? Did they see like uh, their mother cheating on the father or vice versa? And that made them think that love wasn't real, like whatever, right? Yeah, you, whatever the, the source of that cause is, ask yourself what that's going to be because that's actually going to be part of your character element um, and it's going to add that depth that we were kind of talking about before um, so if you want to add romance the question is how would you like to add it into your respective genre so obviously different genres have different story beats they have different expectations from readers and uh, the three questions I would propose for you guys to ask and again if you are just joining um, the slideshow will be available for you afterwards you can have it um, for your own reference to refer to and in, in later down the road um, so if you have a romance how does this romance subplot ripple throughout your story if it doesn't um, have a thread into the main story plot or it doesn't have a connection or it doesn't cause something that um, basically interacts with the world that you created find a way for it to actually do that. Um, otherwise, you've got like a weird standalone plot. And let me tell you one thing. If a reader uh, sees that you have done this for the sake of filling pages, they are very savage. They don't care about your feelings. They don't care about how much time and effort you put into this book. They're just going to rip apart the stuff that you did inaccurately, and then they're going to call you names. Say that from experience. <laughs> um, what is the problem that this romance solves for your character? And what I mean by problem, because that's why I put it in quotes, is within a story and if you guys happen to get that character arc book it, it goes into a lot more lengthy detail but uh, a character within a story has what is referred to as the lie they tell themselves now what this lie is kind of depends on your character and what kind of character growth that you would like them to have throughout the story this lie could be something as simple as uh, i am not good enough to be king i am not worthy of love i mean nothing in the universe my pain means nothing right now, on the surface, that may not mean a lot, but that could be something that would cause a big character growth throughout the, the story. So let me circle back to uh, my pain means nothing. So let's say that you have a character and they spend a lot of time doing dangerous situations in order for the greater good, right? I'm thinking a little bit of Spock here. Um, and that lie that they tell themselves is my pain means nothing. And the reason that they think that my pain means nothing is because in the greater good, my sacrifice is what's needed for the bigger group of people, right? But sometimes what that person needs is for one individual to make that one person feel like they're valued and that they're worth more than an ant in the in the collective, right? And that might make them feel like they've got more self-worth, that they've got some more investment in the world, and it might give them a different reason to fight for. So instead of fighting for the the hive mind, so to speak, not to call not to call them that. Um, but they might have like their own um, push to have that individuality and then they'll learn like their own desires and things that they want and how to go forth and get that. Not quite in the narcissistic way, but kind of in an individuality sense. Uh, now, this last question, and if you add a romance beat, this may or may not be a mandatory thing that you have to put in there. If you're looking at causing romance in the sense that you've got two characters together, um, think, uh, think 300 right? You had the king and his queen, they were together, the story goes through, I don't know who's seen this, and I know telling people spoilers upsets them, um, but at the end of the story, right, uh, that, that couple is not together anymore for various reasons, right? So, um, this question doesn't quite apply to them, but for the people that are finding, go ahead and spill, the movie's been out for years, okay, fine. So, you've got the king and queen, Right, um, they were already established at the end, at the beginning of the story. They had a great marriage, good kids, all this other stuff. Uh, king goes off to war for his nation. Queen stays behind to fight a different kind of war. And at the end of that story, right, the the king stands his ground for his 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 values, and he doesn't come home to his queen. Right. So this question, um, I you know what, I take that back. That kind of does fit in with. Uh, sorry to of... sorry to butt in. Um, when you're done giving this. Uh movie synopsis slash history lesson uh, lesson uh monkey Cun did have a question he had written out so um... oh okay yeah um i'll get to that just a second yep go ahead. um i'll just circle it back to um why does your fi why is your character fighting against or rejecting love so for the people who um might have trust issues for whatever reason maybe a bad girlfriend or they saw a bad example from an adult figure that they that they appreciated or some kind of other real life thing 
Um, ask yourself why they are fighting against that love at the time, because that's going to reveal a different kind of layer um, within that character development that will flesh out your character, give them more dynamics. So mm -hmm. definitely ask yourself that. All right, Monkey okay. Coon. Monkey Coon makes me think of Song Wong Kong. I already like you. All right, so for the sake of the recording, because not everybody can see this, I think. Um, so I have three romances in my story. One is a one-sided crush that doesn't go well and ends in betrayal plot. However, the two characters don't have much of an interaction aside from... Oh, I can't say that word right now. Um, Reconciliation. Thank you. Um, and to not bother all three of them, since this is the weaker one, it is enough to warrant it to be a part of the plot, or should I do more with it? So it really depends on what you want to do with that character. If you feel like this defining moment is something that would kind of shape like their attitude or their um, view of the world as they go forth, then yeah, absolutely. Um, when I work with new authors and they're trying to figure out how to add depth to their characters and we're doing background stuff, I always tell folks when you're writing a background from a character, you write one paragraph for childhood, you write one paragraph for teenagehood, and then you write a paragraph for recent history. Ooh, can I give firsthand account on that? Because you actually taught me. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so developing your characters is mad important. Like, because this, all this she's laying out fucked me up because I didn't think this far ahead at all. I just kind of wrote in the middle of everything that was going on. And this was, and uh, the 13 weeks of her teaching me was essentially me repairing them all the mistakes i made uh for my first draft also uh to piggyback uh from the point you're making about monkey Kun's question yeah if you're gonna have a betrayal the especially one that involves a woman you have to make sure that both characters or yeah both characters that are uh involved with this woman have a developed relationship themselves like both of them uh, you don't have to do this, but they could be best friends, for example. Um, that That's one way you can do it, but if there's no real relationship between these two characters, um, I wouldn't say there's no reason to include it, but one character has to leave with negative feelings at the very least. I think you can still salvage this if, even if uh, both of those characters are just acquaintances, but um, I'll, I'll give you back the, the floor. Uh, Carol. Oh. oh, thank you. Um, you were saying that it made me think of um, two books. These aren't writing craft books, and I'll put the I'll send you guys the titles here in a minute. Um, for those of you who don't know, I have a psychology background, and there's a there's an individual. His name is Gabor Mate, and Gabor Mate uh, talks about how rejection and abandonment has an effect on the psyche and the way that it kind of moves forward and affects us as adults. And you could pretty much type his name in YouTube and all of his talks are up there. But he references a book that I actually just finished reading. I found it really amazing. And it's called The Body Keeps Score. And The Body Keeps Score is it's basically a long essay in regards to what happens with individuals who suffer trauma for a long period of time. And, um, and when I mean like a long period of time, I mean like, you know, maybe it was trauma that they experienced in the Vietnam War, or maybe it was the trauma that they experienced when they were a child in an abusive household, right? Um, and if you guys really want to dive into those onion layers, those are really two excellent resources that I could recommend for that. Since we're talking about um, Monkey's question in, re in regards to like, what do I do about this character that has to do with betrayal? Um, and to the last note that I will live on, that live on that that I will leave on that before I move on is that um, an individual has the ability not to remember everything perfectly not not in a, a historical account kind of way but they will remember how that moment made them feel right and that was something that we used to say in teaching it was uh, your te your students will not remember what you taught them but they will remember how you made them feel so whatever the emotional impact of that moment that happened with the betrayal is that's going to linger a lot more than the details of it all right so we're going to talk about romance um so these are the main romance beats and what i mean by main ro romance beats is that these are the things that romance readers expect to happen in a story now does this apply to everything that you were doing within your own story absolutely not if you are writing horror and you've got a little bit of romance in there you do not have to write all of these beats like absolutely not i would not i would not tell you that 
Um, consider this more inspiration for you to kind of take in, percolate on, and then kind of brew into your own plot. Uh, if you could not tell, I really like coffee. So um, within romance, there are four phases. There's the, uh, the setup, the falling in love, the retreating from love, and the fighting for love. So again, with the setup, who are these people? Why do they not want to fall in love? And what happens that makes them have to be in the room together, so to speak? And that's not even like so much like an inkling of them following love. It's just somehow plot has happened and we have to be in the room together kind of thing. Uh, falling in love is where these two individuals um, start to do the progression towards following love. Maybe they find out that they both like chocolate ice cream and that's what brings them together. I don't know. It's your story. You guys know what it is that brings these folks together. Uh, retreating from love. So normally with the retreating uh, from love is when they've begun to have that love. It feels too good to be true. They start doing some self-fulfillment prophecy about how this relationship is not going to work out for one reason or another. And they start to pull away from each other. Um, kind of think about it when you're like with a new love interest and it's all working out. And for some reason, you're kind of like, oh man, it's going to be a shame when this is gone. Like nothing's happened, right? But that, that seed has been planted. That person is just waiting for it to happen. And then one day, one day the inevitable happens. They folded the toilet paper the wrong way. That's it. It's all over. We can't be oh, together. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I'm joking, but sometimes the reasons that these two characters don't stay together is, is really just that shallow to me. Um, so they retreat from love now that they've had this taste. And then the last phase is going to be when they're kind of like, oh my God, I was stupid. Toilet paper doesn't matter except during the COVID. So let's go ahead and fall in love anyway. Right. So then they'll come together, be together and stay together. And that will, that's, that's pretty much the phase. So that was my, my COVID love, love romance for you guys. Um, now I gave you, I gave you the over, stop laughing at me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm laughing in silence. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, anyway, so uh, what's going to happen after this is going to be a little bit more detailed of what those beats look like. Um, so each of these phases have four beats. So phase one, the setup, right? Bringing these characters together. This is when you introduce the two main characters. In romance, sometimes you will flip-flop between the two love interests as they come together. The meet cue is usually when the characters first meet. Maybe they ran into each other. Uh, maybe they literally ran into each other by crashing their trucks into each other. Or maybe they found out, uh, maybe they met because the other one had to evict the other from their shop kind of thing, right? It, it doesn't matter, but somehow these two characters uh, meet. And then in this encounter, when these two characters meet, they have a moment where there's like absolutely no way, not this person. I cannot be with this person. They don't fill up the toilet paper the right way. Right, they said they do it in triangles. I can't do that. My life is over. Uh, this example, and then, man. <laughs> I'm here for you. Okay. Yeah, um, and then the adhesion. The oh. adhesion is the plot, right? The the reason that they have to come together for some shape or form. Um, and that's whatever your story is going to be. I could give you guys lots of different references, but just know that the adhesion is the plot that glues them together, you know, as they kick and flail along the way. The following love, we're going to have a reminder about why these two characters can't be together. So maybe not on top of the fact that they can't fold the toilet paper the wrong way. Maybe they bother their toast the wrong way, right? Again, I'm looking for shallow reasons. Um, but they'll have another reminder about why these two characters can't be together. Um, you can look at more uh, real life examples, such as uh, the guy finds out that the woman, uh, I don't know. Uh, mm. Already has a child. I was going to say that, but then I was like, I don't want to be that person. But you know what? You said it, so we're going to go with it. Yeah, so bad. let's say that he, he first... We'll, we'll, we'll go with a guy that meets a lady, and maybe she's oh. abrasive at the office, right? Maybe she's a super stern health inspector that's got to make sure that the kitchen has to be on point for the kitchen to pass the health inspection so that way the restaurant can stay open. She comes in, and she's like, absolutely not. Your temperature on your sink is one degree off. I'm closing your kitchen down, right? Like, boom, immediately, reason to not like this lady. One degree, who does that, right? Uh, runs into the lady later, and he kind of, like, sees her. And I'm using he, she pronouns. You guys can switch these as you want. But um, he sees her later, and he's kind of like, oh, man. Like, she's before, like, you continue, she was... before you continue, uh, public service announcement, there are only two genders, all right? Uh, we'll, oh, 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 dear. Okay, so okay, he, he runs this. into her later, and he sees her, and he sees her at her resting bitch face. And it's like, man, I hate that resting bitch face, but she's smoking hot, right? 
and he's having a moment because he's kind of like, you know, she's smoking hot and maybe I should just go over and talk to her and maybe we can ease out this whole kitchen situation. And suddenly the toddler runs over and goes, mommy, mommy. And that guy's having a moment where it's like, I don't know if I want to deal with that. Right. So that might be, uh, that might be a thing right now. You can do this for anything. There was one romance novel that I read where, um, the, a woman got kicked out of her bookshop by the lady that was the property owner. Right. And originally she was like, I can't be with you because you're the property owner. And it was like, I can't just be with you because you're the property owner. But now you're my favorite romance author for lesbian romance. I can't deal with this. I have to go out, walk out with kind of thing. So whatever that is, just, you know, whatever fits your story is what you need to do. I'm doing some kind of outlandish examples here because people remember the dramatics a lot more. Um, the deepening romance or the inkling of desire is actually when these two characters start to kind of come to know each other as individuals. Maybe they learn each other's favorite food or favorite color, or maybe they both don't like the guy that's standing uh, in front of them at the coffee shop hogging up the line where they ask for their super fancy 16 ingredient latte. I don't know. Um, but it's the thing that's going to bring them together and then they'll have a commonality. Deepening interest is where they get to, or deepening desire, excuse me. Uh, is where that bond starts to obviously develop further. They learn favorite colors, they spend more time together, they laugh at each other's jokes, so on and so forth. And then the maybe this could work moment. They uh, they kind of realize that maybe my, my earlier impressions were incorrect. I kind of want to be with this person. They seem really nice. I like it. And they go forward. Midpoint of love is going to be the mid part of your story. And if you have banging in your story, this is kind of when the banging happens. So that's that's kind. Of, I'm kind of glossing over that because it's not that kind of. We're gonna move over. Uh, inkling of doubt. Uh, inkling of doubt. So this is the retreating from love situation, um, and this is uh, when things start to happen that kind of reinforce why people uh, may not think that they're worthy of love or do not deserve love, um, or they again it kind of goes back to that lie that people were telling themselves for. And it's the thing that they're kind of looking for within um, individuals that kind of uh, validify uh, their their own perceptions of, you know, their own reality. There's a really, I say it's a really good book, but I found it a really good book when I read it. It was called Go Unfuck Yourself. And that book was, I thought, really good because... Um, it was about how you walk into relationships with other people already with an expected outcome of how it was going to go. Not a super long book. I liked it a lot. Um, I'll leave you guys a reference. But you could use that when we're talking about why people retreat from love. They start looking for reasons why the relationship shouldn't work, and then that's all they focus on, and then that's that ends up being the thing that breaks them up. So we'll get the inkling from love. Maybe a love interest gets a text from an ex-girlfriend. It's kind of like, why are you talking to her, X, Y, Z? Deepening doubt. Maybe for some reason the ex goes to talk to the ex-girlfriend. Love interest doesn't know, but maybe... The ex goes to talk to the ex-girlfriend because they're asking for help about how to get away from an abusive spouse that they're with at the time, right? You know, stuff that you don't really see in that POV. Uh, the retreat B is when they step away from each other. The shield up is when they get defensive about the love that they have with that person. The breakup is the breakup. It's where they go their separate ways for whatever reason. Uh, and again, I'm talking a lot on these slides. On the actual slide notes themselves, all these details are on there, so you guys should be good to go. Uh, Dark Night of the Soul uh, in Story Beats, that's the kind of when they're at, like, at their lowest point. They don't know what to do. They're really thinking about things that they've done, all the mistakes that they've done in life. Basically, pretend like you're awake at 3 a.m. in the morning. It's the exact same thing. Um, wake up is when they kind of have like that aha moment. It's like, oh my God, she loved me all the time, even if I folded the toilet paper the wrong way, right? It's like, that's such a stupid thing. The way that I folded the toilet paper doesn't matter. I'm going to go tell her I love her. Uh, the Grand Jester is something that is done to show the love not just run over and say hey i love you a lot let's you know let's bang some more it's it's a, it's a thing that is symbolistic to that person uh one novel that i wrote there was a guy who was like an avid hockey fan and the girl he was dating was like his rival team and uh they used to fight a lot about that but his grand gesture was basically showing up to her house in the in the in the uh, jersey of of her favorite team um, which, as a non-sports fan, don't quite understand that, but if you are an avid sports fan, maybe you can get that. Venom says that he's got one. What's one you got? <laughs> okay. 
Spider-Man 2, when uh, Peter goes to the nuclear reactor or the tritium-powered reactor to save Mary Jane and she finds out he's Spider-Man, right? He saves her from a falling piece of debris that is like a quarter a quarter of a building. And that's when she finds out that it, it, uh, Pete was Spider-Man the whole time. That's a good gesture, yeah. So, oh, man, I, I really love that love scene. It. I love Spider Man, but I hate that there's so many Spider Men. But anyway, that's not that's one of the few that like that's one of the uh, types of romance plots I actually like because it doesn't overshadow the point of the movie. That's a true point. Yeah. Yes. Like that. Um. So I'm going to talk about these last few things real quick, and then I'll open up to questions. So what Hold Hearted looks like? That's kind of like what happens when these characters are brought together. They run off into the sunset or pull out. Their machetes and start fighting zombies until the end of the story however that looks for your story that's what that's going to do epilogue for your guys stuff is going to be optional but a lot of romance writers like to have like an ending scene moment where they see that the couple's together maybe they're on the homestead together maybe they've got their kid uh pick your favorite things for some reason the they're still together and living happily ever after um so obviously a lot of what I'm talking about pertains just to romance, um, but what I have up here on the screen are examples of romance as a subplot. Um, His Dark Material, Materials is a really good one. Stardust is a really good one. My personal favorite actually is going to be Six of Crows. I really like how the romance in Six of Crows was. Um, along with, at the bottom, The Strain. Um, now if you guys have watched the show or seen the book, you know that The Strain is basically a modern retelling of Dracula. But they have a, a romance subplot in there, and it's it's woven in a way that actually adds to the suspense of the story rather than being a deterrent. So that's why I really like it in the in the stream. Um, River of Stars by uh, Guy K is is really good, but I'm going to warn you guys: it's kind of like reading um, Game of Thrones, the Chinese aver uh, version. So it's like it's really long. It's very poetic. If it's not your your cup of tea, maybe skip it. But I thought it was really good. All right, questions. I am ready, and we can do whatever discussions you want on this topic or completely derail. I'm ready. Really? Yeah, sorry about that, because um, I'm sorry I was helping my grandmother. Um, so I missed a small part of what you were talking about. Hopefully I'm not catching up on the review. Um, so I did have something I did want to ask, because... Um, there's this person I have a, I, I, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, no, that wasn't the one. Sorry, here it is. Um, so this goes back to something I was mentioning earlier when I was mentioning, like, two boys or two guys, like, kind of, like, being, like, really close, like, best friends since, like, childhood or some of the stuff. And I understand that there was something about interpretation from each reader's point of view. Now, and I do apologize for this because I'm very old era, so I don't know how this stuff works in a way. But is coding a thing when it comes to characters? Because this is where that previous question comes from. Because um, I know I had mentioned um, I had mentioned Sasuke and Naruto earlier, but one more poignant example was a group of was a group of superhero duos known as the Super Sons who in comics was considered like best friends in a way where it was like their friendship was like from two different yokes of the world and they made it work pretty much like how Batman and Superman make it work. Mm -hmm. But um, apparently enough, there was some sort of, it's like there was this huge change with them and there are some people who say that quote unquote queer coding kind of like pushed the Super Sons to kind of like break up as a comic. And um, I was, I guess my question leads back to that concept of coding because I don't understand what it means per se, but it sounds like initially taking a character and somehow putting elements into the character that make them look a certain type of way, AKA coding. But can this affect um the flow of the story even if it's unintentional or even if it's not like your main intent so that goes back to perspective just a little tiny bit um when we're talking about like superhero comics um and, and kind of working with that genre and that style of publishing 
it's a little bit different than when we're talking about like traditional writing um, because with traditional writing as an author you, you you tend to be the one man show right you write the story you make the characters you do everything with them um, in the comic industry there may be one writer but he's got a team of people that work with him at a table so to speak and they will sit down once a month and start working on the the story that's going to come out that month and maybe they'll be paying a little bit too much attention to twitter i don't know why but they do and they'll be trying to work those elements in there because well i mean i do know why they're they're trying to reach um they're trying to cast out the net that's what they call it in marketing and they're oh. trying to bring yeah and so they're trying to bring in more readers um you know budweiser kind of did that recently where they tried a different type of marketing uh campaign in order to bring in a different demographic into their brand to buy their brand and um comics uh is a little bit more fluid in the sense that they have the ability to be a bit more reactive that way now with some books uh we'll use uh, game of thrones as an example game of thrones was written by martin at first name basis like we're friends but we're not um hey, george r r martin yeah george r, r. martin that americano yes that guy um actually i guess that's her name but um he's he's he writes those stories right like there's no team that works with him he decides the plot and the everything and the whole reason we don't have a new book is because it's not just him writing it right okay right no i mean we're going to be waiting forever for that final book to come out um and yeah we'll be here forever um but uh in the situation with coding if if the perspective is that it's something that the audience wants a lot of times the studio will fall under pressure to it um maybe a different example that we could kind of look at is rooster teeth with ruby oh, so no. right Too well rooster, well i mean look at i mean one of the things that happened with rooster teeth and ruby is that we had these these girls that were brought together right and they were going to be um, good friends and they're going to stand up against the forces of whatever and they were going to put their heels on the ground and fight 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 but due to the sheer um, volume of the peer pressure that they were feeling to have two characters come together two characters did end up coming together and it honestly threw off the entire group dynamic because instead of caring about the team as a whole those two people prioritize themselves first and then the team second right like it, it totally messed with the team dynamic and in, in so many different ways one and then later and then later when one of them kind of like fell off the face of the earth, it felt like a cheap plot device, right? Yeah. 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 Uh, with, like, best friends, just wanted to add it. Uh, Lord of the Rings, like the way Tolkien wrote his story, like the interactions with Sam and Frodo, uh, he based it off of his experience in World War One, where, you know, how the- Oh yeah, trans warfare. Yeah, they built the bond, and that's how you can, uh, like, if you have trouble writing best friends, you can think about, like, how situations like that, it's an extreme situation, but, like, how war brought these men together because, you know, you fight together or you die. It's, like, an extreme situation, but that's how uh, bonds like that could be really deep because, you know, you almost died, but you managed to survive by being close to your uh, fellow soldier and stuff like that. That's... Yeah, no, speaking as a military veteran, I can tell you that going to war with a different person, that bond that happens between two people who goes to war, it's not the same war that, it's not the same bond that you have with the friend that you go to work with, it's not the same bond that you have with your spouse. It is a very different bond.